40 Hadith, an exposition, second revised edition. Author Sayyid Ruhullah Musawi Khomeini. 33rd Hadith, Wilaya and Works. Arabic text, English translation. With my chain of authorities reaching up to the pioneering Sheikh Muhammad ibn Yaqub al Kulaini, from Ahmad ibn Muhammad, from Al Hussein ibn Said, from someone who narrated it from Ubaid ibn Zurara, from Muhammad ibn Mar'id, that he said, I said Abu Abdullah alayhi salam, a hadith has been narrated to us from you that you said, when you have acquired the ma'rifa that is of the rights of the imams alayhi salam, then do whatever you want. He replied, I have indeed said that. I said to him, even if one were to commit adultery and theft and drink wine, he said, Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. By God, they, that is those who have interpreted our statements in such a manner, have not been just to us. Is it fair for them to believe that they would get away with whatever they do, whereas we ourselves will be answerable for our actions? What I said was that when you have acquired ma'rifa, perform any works you want, whether it's good, be great or small, for they will be accepted of you. Exposition In the sentence, Hadith and Ruwiya. Hadith is Mubtada and Ruwiya is its khabar. Annaka with Fatha on the Alif is the khabar of an elliptic Mubtada. Ayya huwa ank. In the statement Ida Araftak, the Ma'rifa, knowledge meant in this tradition, is the Ma'rifa of the Imams. Salam. In the expression Qaltu, Qala Qaltu, maybe either in the first or the third person. In wa in nazano, the in is wasliya, and the phrase means if they acquire ma'rifa, they may do whatever they want, even if it is a major sin. The phrase inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un is an expression of istirja and is said at the time of a severe and great calamity. And since this slander or misunderstanding was a great calamity, the Hazrat uttered it in order to dissociate and absolve himself totally from it. The phrase anna takuna means fi anna takuna, that is, they have not been fair to us in believing that they would be quit of all accountability for their actions due to their belief in us, that is, our imamat while we ourselves would be accountable and answerable for all our actions. The Imam then clarifies what he had meant, that belief in wilaya is a prerequisite for the acceptability of works before God, as will be discussed hereafter, God the Exalted Willing. Explanation of absence of contradiction between traditions that exhort one to perform. Ibada and abstain from sins and other traditions which apparently conflict with them. It should be known that if one were to refer to traditions that have been narrated concerning the states of the noblest messenger وسلم, and the imams of guidance and study the character of their devotion, Ubudiya, their pains taking diligence, their lamentations and entreaties, their humility and sense of indigence, their fear and sorrow before the sacred station of the Lord of Majesty, and if one ver were to study the character of their intimate supplications before the fulfiller of needs, traditions whose number far exceeds what is required to establish tawattur, and similarly, if one were to refer to the counsels given by the noble messenger to the commander of the faithful, and also the counsels given by the imams to one another, as well as to elect of the Shia and their sincere followers, the greatly eloquent and emphatic exhortations that they would make warning them against disobedience to God, the exalted, a theme with which the books of tradition and chapters relating to doctrinal legal duties are replete. He would be convinced that certain other traditions whose apparent and literal import contradicts with these traditions are not to be taken literally. Therefore, if possible, they must be interpreted in a way that they do not conflict with those explicit and definitive traditions which constitute the essentials of the faith, or they must be reconciled. 
Otherwise, they must be referred back to their authors. In these pages, we cannot possibly reconcile all the relevant traditions or mention even a hundredth part of them and explain them. However, it is unavoidable that we mention some of these narrations so that the truth is disclosed. Arabic text, English translation. Al Kulaini reports in Al Kafi with his isnad from Abu Abdullah, Imam Sadiq al Salam, that he said, Our Shia flaw followers are those whose hearts are informed with sorrow and grief and who are lean as a result of intense sorrow and worship. They are those who, at the fall of the darkness of the night, turn to it with sadness. There are many narrations on this topic describing the characteristics of the Shia. Arabic text, English translation. From him, Froth al Mufaddal, who narrates from Abu Abdullah, Jafar ibn Muhammad al Sadiq that he said, Beware of these base people who claim to be Shias. Verily, the Shia of Ali salam, are none except one who is chaste in his manner of earning his livelihood and sexual conduct. It is one whose diligence is intense, who works for his creator, hoping for his reward and fearing his punishment. When you see such people, know that they are the followers, the Shia of Ja'far. Arabic text, English translation. Al Hassan ibn Muhammad al Tusi, the Shaykh al Taifa, narrates with his chain of authorities from Imam al-Radha from his father, from his grandfather, from Abu Jafar, Imam Baqir salam that he said to Khaythama, convey this message to our followers Shia, that we do not avail them against God, that is, do not neglect works for reliance upon us. Tell them that that which is with God cannot be attained except with works. Tell them that of all the people, the greatest regret on the day of resurrection will be of those who speak about some aspect of justice, but violate it in practice to do something else. Tell our followers that if they observe what they have been asked to, they will be triumphant on the day of resurrection. Arabic text. English translation. In Al-Kafi, Al-Kulaini narrates with his chain of authorities from Abu Jafar salam that he said, Do not be carried away by false doctrines. By God, our followers, Shias, are none except one who obeys Allah. This means, do not invent doctrinal excuses to justify disobedience to God, and do not adopt any false notion that we are Shia, and our attachment to the Ahlul Bayt is the means of our salvation. By God, our Shia is none except him who obeys God the Exalted. Arabic text. English translation. In Al Kafi Al Kulaini reports with his chain of authorities from Jabir, from Abu Jafar alayhi salam, that he's Jabir said, He said to me, O Jabir, is it sufficient for one who follows Shiaism to claim that he loves us, the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam? By God, our followers, the Shia, are none except him who is weary of God and obeys him. So fear God and work for the sake of that which is with God. There is no kinship between God and anyone. The most preferred and honored of creatures before God, the exalted are those who are most God-weary amongst them, and are most obedient to his commands in their conduct. O Jabir, by God, one cannot attain nearness to God except through obedience. We do not possess any guarantees of bara'a, acquittal from hellfire, and none has an argument against God. Whoever is obedient to God is our friend, Wali, and whoever is disobedient to God is our enemy. Our wilaya cannot be attained except through works and piety. Also in the noble al-Kafi, it is reported with a chain of authorities from Imam al-Baqir al-Salam, Baqir al-Ulum, that he said, Arabic text, English translation, O community of the followers of the household of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you should be those who represent the golden mean, to whom the extremists ghali must return, and to whom those who lag behind thali must catch up. A man named Sa'ad belonging to the Ansar said to him, May I be your ransom? What is an extremist Ali? The Imam replied, They are a group who say things about us that we do not claim for ourselves. Therefore, they do not belong to us and we do not belong to them. Then he asked, What is Atali? The Imam replied, It is one who seeks guidance but does not know its way, though he wants to work and attain goodness. Then the Imam, turning to his followers, the Shia said, By God, we do not have any warrant, bara'a, to save you from God's wrath and punishment. And there is no kinship between God and us. 
We do not have any arguments before God and we do not attain nearness to Him except through obedience and compliance to His commands. Any one of you who obeys God will be benefited by our wilaya and friendship. Our wilaya will be of no avail to anyone amongst you who is disobedient to God. Woe to you should you be conceited. Woe to you should you be conceited. It is also narrated in the Noble Al-Kafi that Imam Al-Baqir salam said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam once stood on the rock of Safa and addressing his kinsmen said, O descendants of Hashim, O children of Abdul Muttalib, I am the apostle of Allah sent to you and I have loving concern for you. Verily my works belong to me and the works of each of you belong to him. Do not say that Muhammad is our kinsman and soon we will be let in wherever he enters. No, by God, O sons of Abdul Muttalib, Talib, my friends from amongst you and the others are none except the pious. Let it be known to you that I will not recognize you on the day of resurrection as one of my ummah. When you come carrying the world, that is the works done by you for the love of the world on your backs, while other people come to the bearing the hereafter, that is the works done by them in faith and for the life of the hereafter. And it is also mentioned in the foregoing narration of Jabir that Imam al-Baqir salam said, O Jabir, do not let false doctrines and opinions deceive you into imagining that the love of Ali salam is sufficient for you. Can it be sufficient for a man to declare, I befriend I befriend Ali and am an adherent of his wilaya, without being diligent and without working much good works. Truly were he to say that I love the Messenger of Allah and the Messenger of Allah was better than Ali, while neglecting to follow him in his conduct sirah and failing to act in accordance with the sunnah, his love would not be of any avail to him. There is a famous episode that once Tawus, a companion of the fourth Imam, heard someone crying, lamenting, and pleading. The cries continued until they ceased, and it appeared as if the one who was lamenting had fallen unconscious. On approaching, he saw that it was Imam Ali ibn al Hussein alayhi salam. He took the Imam's head into his arms and said to him, You are the son of the Messenger of Allah and the beloved of Fatima Zahra. After all, the paradise belongs to you. He said these words in order to console soul the imam that master replied god has created paradise for one who worships him and obeys him even if it were an ethiopian slave and he has created the hell for those who disobey him even if it were a Qurayshite or a, the chief of the Quraysh. These were solved of the sacred traditions, clear and explicit, suggesting the falsity and wrongness of the false hopes of ours as sinners and lovers of the world, hopes which derive from satanic longings and are contrary to reason and revelation. Naqal. Add to these the noble Quranic verses, such as these statements of God, the exalted. Kullu nafsin bima kisabat rahina. Every soul is pledged for what? Every soul is pledged for what it has earned, Surah 74, verse 38. And such statements of God the Exalted as And whosoever does good, an atom's weight will see it. And whoso does ill, an atom's weight will see it. Surah 99, verse 78. And such other statements as لَهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ وَعَلَيْهَا مَا كَسَبَتْ For it the soul is what it has earned and against it is what it has merited. Surah 2 verse 286 and there are other noble verses besides present on every page of the divine scripture and to explain them away or to meddle with their meaning is contrary to logical necessity. As against these, there are other traditions which are also recorded in authentic books, but which are, as a rule, capable of reconciliation with the above-mentioned traditions. And even if a reconciliation should appear to be unsatisfactory, and were they not susceptible to reinterpretation, ta'wil, it is neither in accordance with sound reason or the interest the rura, of Muslims to go against all these authentic, sahih, explicit, and mutawatir traditions which which are confirmed by the literal meanings of the Qur'an and the unambiguous text of the Furqan. Among these traditions is that which has been narrated by the Thiqat al-Islam al-Kulayni with his chain of authorities from Yusuf ibn Thabid ibn Abi Said from Abu Abdullah that he said,
Arabic text. English translation, nothing can harm one by the side of faith and nothing can benefit one by the side of unbelief, kufr. There are several other traditions bearing this theme. The honored traditionists Majlisi has interpreted this group of traditions with the suggestion that the harm in the above tradition means entry into hellfire or remaining in hell forever. This interpretation that what is meant by harm is entry into hell does not preclude that it might be accompanied with other torments in Barzakh, purgatory and in the halts of the day of resurrection. This writer thinks that these traditions may be interpreted as implying that faith illuminates the heart in such a manner that if supposedly an error or sin is committed by man, it is compensated by the means of the light and faculty of faith, with repentance and penitent return to God and the person possessing faith in God, and the hereafter does not leave his works unattended until the day of reckoning. On the basis, these traditions, in fact, exhort one to hold on to the faith and to remain in the state of faith, like a similar tradition narrated in the Noble Al-Kafi from Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, that Musa alayhi salam said to Khidr, I have been honored by your company, give me some counsel. Khidr said to him, hold on to that with which nothing could harm you and without which nothing will be of any benefit to you. Arabic text. And among these is this tradition, Arabic text. Al-Kulaini reports with his chain of authorities from Muhammad ibn al-Rayyan ibn al-Salt, who narrates in a marfu tradition from Abu Abdullah al-Salam that he said, the commander of the faithful al-Salam often used to say in his sermons, O oh people, take care of your creed, deen. Take care of your deen, for a vice committed in it is better than a virtue performed outside it. The vice committed in it is forgiven and the virtue performed without it is not accepted. This noble tradition and others like it, whose aim is to exhort people to follow the right religion, imply that the vices of the faithful and the followers of the true religion are ultimately pardoned, as God says, Inna Allaha yaghfiru dhunuba jami'a. Verily, God would pardon all sins. Surah 39, verse 53. It is on this basis that it may be said that their vices are better than the virtues of others which are never accepted by God. Perhaps acts of virtue which lack the conditions of acceptance such as faith, iman, and wilaya possess a greater darkness. In brief, this tradition does not imply that the faithful are quiet of their vices. One of them is the famous tradition which is said to be well known, mashhur, amongst both the groups, that is the Shia and the Sunnis. Hubbu aliyin hasanatun la tadurru maha sayyatun wa bughzuhu sayyatun la tanfa'u maha hasana The love of Ali is the virtue by whose side no sin is harmful and his enmity is a vice with which no virtue is of any benefit. This noble tradition is similar to the hadith mentioned earlier concerning faith iman. Its meaning is either in accordance with the probability suggested by Marhum Majlisi that the meaning of harm is eternal confinement in hell or entry into it. That is, the love of that master is the essence of faith, its perfection and completion, which results in one's being rescued from hell with the means of the intercession of the intercessors. This interpretation, as pointed out earlier, does not preclude one's having to undergo the various torments of the purgatory, barzakh, as stated in a hadith where the imam has said, we shall intercede for you on the day of resurrection, but the care of your life in the purgatory is up to yourselves. Or it means what we have mentioned, that the love of that master results in the emergence of a luminosity and faculty of faith in the heart that prompts one to refrain from sins. One should one and should one become afflicted with sin on occasion, he would remedy it through repentance and penitence, not allowing the matter to get out of hand and not permitting the carnal self to break loose its reins. Moreover, there is a group of traditions that are cited under the following noble verse of the Surat al-Furqan, Arabic text. English translation, the servants of the All-Merciful are those who call not upon another God with God, nor slay the soul God has forbidden except by right. 
Neither fornicate, for whosoever does that shall meet the price of sin doubled shall be the testament for him on the resurrection day, and he shall dwell therein humbled, save him who repents and believes and does righteous work those... God shall change their evil deeds into good deeds, for God is ever all forgiving, all compassionate. Surah 25, verse 68 to 70. There are numerous traditions that are cited in exegesis under this verse, and we shall confine ourselves to citing only one of them, for they are quite close to one another in meaning and content. Arabic text. English translation. A Sheikh Tusi in his Amali reports with his chain of net authorities from the highly regarded traditionalists, Muhammad ibn Muslim al Thaqafi, that he narrates, I asked Abu Jafar Muhammad ibn Ali concerning the statement of God, Almighty and Glorious, those God will change their evil deeds into good deeds, and God is all forgiving, all compassionate. He replied, The sinful believer will be brought on the day of resurrection until he's made to stand in the hall of the reckoning. The God, the exalted, himself would take charge of his reckoning, and none of mankind will come to know about his account of deeds. Then he will inform the believer of his sins that he may confess to his sins. God, the Almighty and the Glorious, shall say to the scribes, the angels who write men's deeds, change them into good deeds and disclose them to the people. Thereat, people will say, this servant did not per perpetrate a single sin. Then God shall order him to be escorted into paradise. This is the interpretation ta'wil of the verse, and that relates particularly to the sinners from amongst our followers, Shia. The reason for citing the above noble verse completely and prolonging the discussion is that the topic is of a major importance, and many of the sermonizers, Ahl Mimbar, interpret such traditions in a misleading manner for the people. Their connection with the noble verse would not have been revealed without the citation of the noble verse. On this basis, I am compelled to protract the discussion, even if it should be tiresome. If one were to study the latter part of the verse, one would know that all people are absolutely responsible for their deeds and accountable for their ugly actions excepting those who attain faith and repent for their sins and perform righteous deeds. This is how Imam al-Baqir al has explained the verse describing the character of the reckoning of such people, which, however is special to the followers of the Ahl Bayt and other people, do not partake of it. That is because true faith is not realized except with the wilaya of Imam Ali al and his infallible and pure successors, Osiya alayhi salam. Rather, faith in God and the Messenger would not be accepted without wilaya, as will be mentioned in the next section, God willing. And this noble verse and the traditions relating to its interpretation must be considered as belonging to the primary proofs, for they imply that if a person should possess faith and should he compensate for his sins with repentance and righteous deeds, he would not be covered by this verse. Hence, my dear, let not the shaitan delude you, and let not the carnal appetites deceive you. Of course, a lazy person, afflicted with lusts and the love of the world, property and position such as this author is always after finding some pretext in order to justify his laziness. He turns to anything that agrees with his appetites and affirms his carnal lusts and satanic imaginings opening his eyes and ears to it without delving into its real meaning and without considering that which contradicts it and is opposite to it. Poor man, he imagines that he is, God forbid, permitted every unlawful act and is untouched by the pen of accountability, na'udhu billah, at the mere claim of being a Shia and attached to the household of purity and infallibility. Wretched man, he does not know that shaitan has made him blind. There is always the danger that his, this hollow and futile love would also slip out of his hands at the end of his life, and he would be resurrected empty-handed within the ranks of the enemies, Nawasib of the Ahlul Bayt. The claim of love is not acceptable from someone who has no proof to substantiate it. It is not possible that I may love you and be sincerely attached to you while my conduct is contrary to all your goals and objectives. The fruit of true love is deeds that are in harmony with that love, and should it lack this fruit, one must know that it was not real love, but only an imaginary fancy. 
The noble messenger and his honored household, alayhi salam, spent all their lives in disseminating the law, morality, and doctrines of Islam, and their sole objective was to communicate the commands of God and to reform and refine human beings. They willingly bore hardships when they were killed, plundered, and insulted in the way of these goals, and did not flinch from marching ahead. Hence their followers, the Shias and the lovers, Muhab, is one who shares their objectives, moves in their footsteps, and follows their traditions. The fact that verbal confession and practical action have been considered as essential elements of faith in the noble traditions is a natural secret and a prevailing law of God. Because the reality of faith is essentially associated with expression and action, it is intrinsic in the nature of the lover to express his love and passionate yearning for the beloved and to act as required by faith and the love of God and his awliya. If someone does not act, he does not have faith and love. And his apparent faith in his hollow and soulless love would be wiped out by some slight accident, including the pressures of the deathbed and the grave, and one would enter the abode of retribution empty-handed. Wilaya of the Ahlul Bayt, alayhi salam, the condition for acceptability of works, that which is implied by the latter part of the noble tradition being expounded, that wilaya and marifa are prerequisites for the acceptance of works is a matter that is one of the definite or rather necessary doctrines of the sacred Shi'i religion. The traditions on this topic are too numerous to be cited in the, these brief expositions, and their number exceeds the limits of tawattur. However, we shall cite some of them in these pages for tabarruk's sake. Arabic text. English translation. Al Kulaini in Al Kafi reports with his isnat from Abu Ja'far alayhi salam that he said, The crux of the matter and its key, the door of things and the pleasure of the beneficent, all lie in obedience to the Imam after having known him. Be aware that the man who spends his nights in prayer and his days in fasting and gives as all his property as charity sadqa and performs hajj throughout his life without knowing the wilaya of the wali of God and without following him, and without conducting himself and all his actions according to his guidance, such a person has no right to any reward from God and is not one of the faithful. Arabic text English translation. In Wasail al-Shia, it is recorded with a chain of authorities from Abu Abdullah al-Salam that he said, Whoever does not come to God, the Almighty and the Glorious on the day of resurrection with a creed that you follow, no virtue of his will be accepted, nor will any sin of his be overlooked. Arabic text. English translation. In Wasail al-Shia, it is reported in a hadith with a chain of authorities from Abu Abdullah that he said, By God, were it please, may God damn him to prostrate to God for as long as the world lasts after his disobedience and pride. That would not benefit him, and God would not accept it as long as he does not prostrate to Adam as commanded by God the Almighty and the Glorious. The same applies to this disobedient and misguided Ummah after its abandoning the Imam appointed for them by their Prophet. Hence God will not accept any of their acts nor elevate any of their good works unless they carry out what God has commanded them and follow the Imam to whose authority, Walaya, they have been commanded by God to submit and enter through the door that God and his messenger have opened for them. There are many traditions bearing this theme, and it may be inferred from all of them that the recognition of wilayah is a condition for the acceptability of works, or rather that it is the condition for the acceptability of faith in God and the prophethood of the honored prophet. However, as to its being a condition for the validity of the works as stated by some scholars, that that is not certain. Rather, that which is apparent is that it is not a condition as is suggested by many traditions, such as the tradition concerning the non-necessity of the repetition of his acts of worship by a convert to Shiism, Mustabshir. 
accepting the zakah which he had given during the period of his error to those who did not deserve it, he is not required to perform the qadha of his other acts of worship, and God would reward him for them. It is mentioned in another tradition that other acts such as prayer, fasts, hajj, and sadaqah would join you and follow you accepting the zakat, which was paid earlier to those who had no right to receive it and has to be paid to its deserving recipients. And it is mentioned in some traditions that the acts of the ummah are presented to the messenger of God on Thursdays, and God the Exalted reviews them on the day of Arafah and makes them all like dust scattered. The Imam was asked as to who are the persons whose actions are thus treated. The Imam replied that they are the acts of those who are hostile to it and hostile to our followers. And this tradition, as is clear, implies the legal validity and non-acceptability of the actions. In any case, the pursuit of this matter is beyond our present purpose, and all praise belongs to God, firstly and lastly. End of 33rd Hadith, Wilayah and Works. Thank you.